My name is Juliana Nicolasian with the Oklahoma State University Library. Today is Thursday, January 26, 2012, and I'm in Durant, Oklahoma, interviewing Joy Colbreth. This interview is being conducted as part of the inductees of the Oklahoma Women's Hall of Fame Oral History Project. Joy was inducted into the Oklahoma Women's Hall of Fame in 2011. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Well, let's begin by learning a little bit more about you. Can you tell us where you grew up and give us a little background into your early life? Well, I'm an Oki. I was born at Boggy Depot, uh, right at the end of the Great Depression. And um, like so many people, and uh, I was three years old, my family moved to Lubbock, Texas, uh, needing to find work. And so two brothers and a sister moved to Lubbock and uh, to begin to pull bowls and whatever else they could do to make a living. So I grew up in Lubbock, Texas. I graduated from uh, Thomas Lubbock High, uh, 18 years old. And the following December, I married a man from Durant, Oklahoma, and uh, have lived here basically ever since. We've been married 54 years. And uh, so, uh, was raised in Texas, but truly an Okie, and uh, very proud of my upbringing and uh, my family. And um, Boggy Depot back in the old days was a very famous part of Oklahoma. Uh, now it's basically just a park area there. And the house I was born in uh, has now fallen down, but it's still you can still see where it was, and I have pictures of it. Very very small home. Uh, there was a mother and a dad and six children that lived in that house. I uh, don't really know how we did all of that, but uh, we did. We were a happy family and uh, a very loving family. So tells you you don't need a big home and lots of money to be happy and proud of where you came from. Well, I'm going to pull you back a little bit towards your time in Texas growing up. Tell me about the schools you attended, uh, elementary school, junior high. Were they large schools? Were they small schools? Well, in, in the 50s, Lubbock only had one high school of about 100,000 people. So it was a large high school. Uh, elementary school, it was, I uh, can't even remember, it was, the last was Posey, was the name of the elementary school. Um, our schools were pretty large, uh, certainly large when you come talk about southeastern Oklahoma schools. Uh, now Lubbock has several high schools, so um, probably in those days that one high school might have been larger than what their high schools are now with several there. Um, enjoyed those days. Uh, the school was run pretty much like you would run a university. Matter of fact, they told us when you graduated from Lubbock High, you were equivalent to a freshman at Texas Tech. Um, we were pretty much on an honor system. Um, back in those days, they didn't just pass you on to other grades. Uh, if you didn't make at least a C or better in the core subjects, uh, you took those two hours a day. They didn't allow you to take a lot of um, electives. Uh, you might be in reading two hours a day or English or math or whatever. Uh, because when you graduated, you had to be able to do those core subjects. I see that's one of the things nowadays when I visit schools. There are so many electives, and a lot of our kids are not equipped in a lot of the areas that they have to be successful in education and in their life. And so uh, just because we're so much more modern today and all the IT we have and all of those things, I don't know that our schools are any better today than they were. When you were growing up, were there subjects you gravitated towards? Well, I always enjoyed math. Um, of course, <laughs> we didn't take physics and all those types of maths. I'm talking about your basics, uh, basic math and all that. Uh, my dad was very good in math, and we, I, I'm a firm believer that you inherit the genes of your parents. And uh, I think that I had a quick mind for math. And uh, I think I probably inherited a lot of that from him. But then my mom, she was the one that was the good reader and the good speller and those things. So uh, on my mother's side of the family, uh, there was a lot of education. And uh, 
and in some of my dad's too, although my dad only had a third grade education. But her mother was educated and her dad was educated too. So what would you do for fun? Now or then? Then. 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 Oh, then. well, I used to love to dance and was pretty good. Matter of fact, one time I danced with Elvis Presley at the Cotton Club in Lubbock, Texas. Um, we had a teen town that on Friday nights, all the teenagers had a place to go and dance, and Buddy Holly had a band. Went to school with him, and um, that was before he was famous, and he was a nerd of all nerds. And uh, But I enjoyed dancing. Uh, did go to a large high school, Therefore, we didn't get to play sports like your girls did in the smaller towns. We had PE, but we didn't play basketball. We didn't play volleyball and compete against other schools. So we didn't have the sports uh, thing. I loved to roller skate. I was pretty good at that. I played roller hockey some. We had a team called the Rolling Ghost, and we played some of them surrounding larger towns. Um, did some of that. Enjoyed it. So I loved to skate, loved to dance, was pretty active, always very strong. Um, I feel like to this day that that's the one gift that God has given me is uh, a strong body. Even at this age, I'm still able to work, do the things I want to do, exercise. Um, so far, that's not been taken. Where do you rank? Uh, are you the oldest, youngest? Oh, I'm the youngest. I'm the, the smartest and the best looking of my whole family. So, since you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as you're growing up, any major role models in your life during those early years? Well, I think we all have that and definitely I did. As I said, my mother and dad were, um, thank goodness in the old days, your mother and dad stayed together. So I came from uh, what now wouldn't be called a normal home. I had my own mother and my own dad in the home. Um, and they were always good role models. I had a wonderful mother that was very kind, very gentle, very Indian. Mama didn't talk a lot, uh, but learned a lot of patience. She was a very patient person, a uh, very giving person. So I learned a lot from my mother. Um, I think most kids or uh, people my age are going to tell you that their parents were their heroes. Um, my old brother, just older than me, uh, he had opportunity with lots of hard work and lots of planning and uh, a lot of determination to go to school. Um, watched him. I always wanted to go on to school. Knew if he could do it, I could. And uh, so he was a role model for me. He played football in high school and in Texas, as it still is, that's uh, almost a god. You know, everybody thinks football is it. And uh, and we certainly did back in those days. Lubbock had a great team, and, and Charles was a great player. So I was always proud of him, uh, the things he did in high school. Um, had two ladies lived in Lubbock. Um, I was young, just a small girl. I used to walk to church. Uh, Chapel Hill Baptist Church was just a little just a little ways from my house. And I attended services there. Um, there was a lady by the name of DeVale Brown. She was the girl's auxiliary leader. And she was not married. She was about 25 years old. So I thought she's old as the hills, of course. Uh, she was a very pretty woman. But she, taught, she told me about Jesus. Uh, a Mrs. Lemon was my Sunday school teacher, and she really taught me a lot of scripture and was very good with the young people. Probably not six months after I was married and moved to Oklahoma, she died with cancer. And I often look back and think about just before I left, she gave me a wedding shower, and she had to have been very ill at that time. Uh, if, if I didn't realize it, but now I'm older and think back that how she died, she had to have been, but she still cared about me. And so I would have to say that both of those women paid, uh, played a great part in my life. Uh, they taught me uh, about the most important person in the whole world, 
uh, that has ever been or ever will be, and that's Jesus. So they played a very important part in my life. So you're, you're growing up, you're graduating from Lubbock and, and you're, you're getting married, but before you get married, or do you think, are you thinking about what you want to be when you get older? Well, you have to remember I'm 72 years old. In my day, when a girl graduated from high school, you got married. That's just what you did. And so uh, even though I'd always wanted to go to school, I just figured that I'd get married, and I did. Well, back in those days, we didn't have birth control. So within four years, I had three daughters and um, still wanted to go to school, but there wasn't any way to work with three small babies. Uh, I have a very wonderful husband who has always been supportive of me, and we talked about me going to school. I explained to him that I couldn't be the helpmate I wanted to be, unless I was educated. And I knew I could do the schoolwork. And so we began to plan and figure out how in the world can I go to college? There weren't, you know, I wasn't gonna get a scholarship. There wasn't any financial aid. Even though I'm Indian, you had to be one quarter then of one tribe. And I am one quarter, but not of one tribe. And so I couldn't even get any scholarships from the Indians. So we began to wander and figure and plan, and uh, we planted gardens, we raised our own beef, uh, did everything we possibly could to save money, and he paid all of my tuition so I could go to school. Uh, began that, did that for over two years, and when my youngest daughter turned five to start to uh, kindergarten, then I started working at the uh, local university here, Southeastern University. Retired from there after 27 years uh, with them and went to work for the nation. But uh, that's how we planned and how we worked and saved. And I had a neighbor that uh, had five children, and after she'd put her children on the school bus, she would uh, come up and stay with my three daughters while I went to school. And uh, then after I started Southeastern University, I finished my education. Uh, I received, I have three master's degrees from Southeastern and uh, went to school until I was 48 years old, took a class every semester, uh, just to be sure that I had everything I could that might help me down the road. And it has, it's helped me at the Choctaw Nation uh, in the administrative work I do. So always been in school. Uh, advocate of education. I believe that that's freedom for people and their very best chance to be what they want to be in life is through education. Well, you had that, your mind set and then y'all really worked on it. So you could, mm -hmm. that's, that's important. But I didn't really know what I wanted to be then. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, of course, education was the thing more for people like myself. I knew I didn't want to be a nurse. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were several different areas. I always wanted to go to law school, but there wasn't a school in this area with three small children. Uh, I won't say it was impossible, but I don't know how I would have done it. Uh, financially, or even with all of the children to take care of. Mm -hmm. So I never did that. I think when I retire from the Choctaw Nation, I'm gonna go to law school. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. <laughs> it's just an idea. It's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, was it difficult uh, juggling school and raising your family? Well, not really. For me, uh, I never tired easily. Just in the last few years, I've learned what being tired is. Now, everyone gets sleepy, but I always could work 16 hours. It didn't matter. I never got tired. So with with a family and uh, being at home, I didn't work outside the home. Uh, when I'd go to school and get the children to sleep at night, I could do homework. Uh, I really had what time I needed to go to school, even with my family. And then as the girls got older, uh, I'm a firm believer in everybody pulling their own weight. So I taught my daughters from a very young age to help. They're all good workers today and very proud of them. Um, but they helped at home. They mowed the yard, they washed the car, they cleaned the house. 
just like I did. So I had a lot of help. Well, that's good. Uh, what are your, your degrees in, your three masters? Well, I have a master's degree. My first master's was in counseling because the program I worked in, uh, Upward Bound, TRIO programs, uh, to move up, I knew I had to have a counseling degree. And uh, so I got that degree in uh, school counseling. And then after that, I knew that I wanted to direct the program. So I got a degree in administration. And then they have what they call a general education master's degree. Uh, just the last one I got just because I needed to keep my teaching certificate. And you had to have, I don't know what their ruling is now. Back then, you had to have certain points. And you could, if you took one three-hour class a year, you could keep your uh, teaching degree updated. So I always took classes, but I didn't take um, cake baking and all that kind of stuff because I don't care about all that. I always took a class that was working toward another degree, and that kept my uh, teaching certificate up to date. Well, if you could, um, you kind of touched upon just a tiny bit. Could you just walk me through your work history? Well, basically, uh, what you call real work. Of course, I worked a little bit when I was young, like everybody else did, in restaurants and a little drugstore and all that. But I actually started working at Southeastern University in uh, 1967 and stayed with them for 27 years. I retired on a Friday. On Monday morning, I was at the Choctaw Nation. I've been there 19 years. Uh, they hired me to build them an adult education program. And uh, I did that, but during that time, there was a big transition at the Choctaw Nation. Uh, we got a new chief, and uh, he asked me if I would like to be over all of their education. And so I took on that position in 1997. I'd been there four years. During that time, we'd built a great adult education program. It still is to this day a good program. Um, so... Since 97, I've been over all of the education programs there with the nation and uh, enjoy it very much. Uh, one of these days I need to go home, but I hadn't went there yet. <laughs> Going back to your time at Southeastern, what were some of the, the roles you were involved with? Well, we had trio programs. I've worked in all of them. I um, also taught in the business education department, uh, sometimes one uh, three-hour class a semester, sometimes two. I enjoyed that. We did quite a bit of um, uh, advisory type counseling with a lot of the students that were there. Um, those types of things. But my main job was working with Upward Bound students, which was a full-time position. Um, enjoyed that very, very much. Got to help a lot of kids. And uh, in southeastern Oklahoma, Upward Bound has been in existence now since... Uh, First summer was 1966, uh, one of Lyndon Johnson's programs. And anywhere you go that there are upward bound programs, you're going to find people uh, anywhere from health to education uh, to law. You're going to find people all over the country that have gotten their starts with the upward bound program. Um, it's a really good feeling when you talk to different ones that probably would not have gone on had they not had that influence and guidance that those programs were able to give you. So feel very rewarded that um, there are a lot of students that I feel like I played a small part in their life that might have helped them to be what they are today. So that's very rewarding. So at the, at the university, though, we did a lot of things. It's like you do in any education program. You have a job, but then you do a lot of things. <laughs> Education's poor, and they always get all they can out of you in every area that you're able to work. So that's how education is. You ever hear back from some of those students? Oh, yes. Hear back from a lot of them. Um, have a dentist in Ardmore that's always offered to do me free dental work. Uh, over, have lawyers. Um, had a young man from uh, Hugo that is an attorney. Uh, he graduated from Stanford and uh, uh, a black kid that uh, was raised by a grandmother. Her name was Arizona. And uh, 
Very poor, but very smart. He scored a 30 on his ACT when he was a sophomore. So he had the ability. He just didn't have the guidance. Um, and teachers, um, almost any school I walk into in southeastern Oklahoma will have a teacher that's an upward bound student. So it gives you a lot of joy to, to see all of that and hope that you, you know, played some part. Uh, one student specifically that visited in her home, uh, they had dirt floors and her mother had died and there were several children and she was the oldest. And her dad wasn't going to let her come back to Upward Bound because he needed her to help. And visited with him um, after we did, and she was a bright, very bright girl. And he allowed her to come on back and go to Upward Bound. And today she is a research scientist at NASA. Uh, you look at those things you think, well, had you not been there, had you not cared uh, to go to the home and go that extra step, she might not have reached her potential. And we would be less because of it because there's not any telling what all that she has accomplished and what she's added to even for all of us. We don't know. So when you help someone else and you care enough and you help them, it'll not only pay them, it'll pay you back. And that all comes from caring. Anyone could have gone to that home, but you've got to have that energy to get up and go and do it. So those are students. I mean, in the 27 years, I could talk about students all day long. That, And I feel that any student, if I don't care if they were a mechanic or whatever, if they achieved the goal that they wanted and were successful, then that's a successful student. If they're doing what they want to do. And, uh, and you know as well as I do, the poorest people in Oklahoma, which is a poor state, the poorest of those are in southeastern Oklahoma. And there's not any industry, there's not jobs. So if they don't get an education, they've got a very poor chance of ever accomplishing what they need to. Even to make a good living for their family is almost impossible. So those are the kinds of things that I've been involved in all of my life. You, you retired after 27 years and then you turn around and you start a new job. Mm -hmm. Did the, did you, how did the nation approach you? Did you, did you know it was coming? Well, it was kind of an equal project. I had talked with uh, different ones at the nation. Uh, I was interested in retiring to do something different. Um, I, and as long as it was in education, I knew I was interested, knew I could do the job. And uh, the Choctaw Nation, in 1997 had very few education programs. So there was a real need there. And I came on board in 93 uh, to build just this one program. And like I said, it's, it's as good as you'll find in the state of Oklahoma now. And that proof is in all of the graduates we have every year. We have at least 140 students each year that get their GED diplomas. So the proof is there in what's happening. Uh, we have moved from that even to we do all of the testing for all students in three counties in this area, and you won't find that in the other tribes. So uh, you'll find the Choctaw Nation or the front runners in a lot of areas. We found that to be true with our language. Uh, we're in 55 high schools now teaching for credit uh, to preserve our language. There's just a lot of things that I see the education department has a its growth and a better foundation. And uh, I look forward to the next person that comes in with new ideas and younger that will even establish this even stronger and better. How did you know how to get started? Did you look at what was going on with other tribes or? Well, not really. I'm, <laughs> I'm one of these people that I don't have enough sense to know that I can't accomplish what I start. And being in ed education as long as I have, you've got some background. You, you've got a lot of understanding about what needs to be done. Uh, what's been my, what's been wonderful about the Choctaw Nation, I've had resources. Uh, when I was at the university, they're just like your public schools or uh, almost any school. There's not much money there. 
you really have to work with what you've got. One good thing about the nation, and one of a credit to them, and and less credit to me, is that when I've always said you give anybody enough money and they can accomplish about anything they want to. And the one thing that I've had in the education department is when we had new programs to start and we presented that to the council and to our chief, we almost always gotten the money to do it. And so when you begin to to work these programs, you um, anyone would know if you're going to have classes, you need the best teachers you can find. Uh, we were able to travel. We had transportation. We were able to pay the students for their mileage when they had to drive. We were able to pay for their testing. So we had incentives for the students, and all of that takes money, and we had that. So can't take a whole lot of credit for a whole lot of things. That, But I do have, it's kind of like the people around me tell me I can't do much, but I have more ideas than anybody then I want them to do the work and accomplish what we're, what we're trying to do. So that's really what it is. It's all about a vision. Did you have in mind some key areas you really wanted to focus on? I did. One of them being language. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm a firm believer that any nationality of people, doesn't matter if you're Indian or not, you lose your language, you've lost your people. Everything's gone. And so we, even though we're a large tribe, we're down to about a thousand first language speakers. That's scary. Uh, we are losing tribes every day uh, that no longer have their language. And so those are one of the things that we could tell almost immediately that we needed to work on and figure out. And Chief came and said, build us a language department. I asked him how he wanted it done, and he said he didn't know. I didn't know either. Um, You don't know all of those things. But you begin to look and see how other people, it doesn't have to be Indian language. It can be any language. How how did they preserve their language? What's going on? And we begin to look at a lot of different things. Um, I know one thing that you've got to get it out there to the people and begin to teach, and they've got to learn, or you will lose it. So that's what we did. We went every direction we could, whether it be the Internet, community classes, uh, high school classes. We teach in Head Starts uh, to the children, and uh, we're really seeing a turnaround. And our biggest goal is we're planning to build a school of language, and we hope to have a training center that we want to train other tribes how to preserve their language. Mm -hmm. Because we work through the State Department. We jumped up through every hoop they have. We have to meet all of the same guidelines that any of your public schools would to teach classes, and we've been able to do that, and that's why we can teach for credit. We now call that a world language. At first, they called it a foreign language. We didn't want it called that, and so now we've got them to put in there that we're teaching a world language, Uh, you know, and and that's fine with us because uh, this is America, and we speak English here. But uh, we do want to teach the Choctaw language, and we're allowed to do that and to teach it in the schools just like if you were taking Spanish or French or anything else. So it's been a journey in, in the education department. We've got, uh, we've got lots of programs. I have a total of 16 programs, and they reach all different areas. Uh, Head Starts, we have 14 Head Starts. And we're building new child development centers every year, which are absolutely wonderful. The resources we have are second to none to teach our young children. Um, So that's wonderful. So there's just a lot of things. Do you have a favorite aspect of your job? Um, I enjoy people. Probably the the thing I like most is I do get to get out and meet other people, travel. Um, I'm pretty much a PR person for the education department. I don't I don't serve on a lot of national committees. I didn't have time to do that. I just finished the No Child Left Behind National Committee, so uh, two years of that. I don't know how much good it'll do. How did that come about, by the way? Well, they were looking for people to serve on that committee. And uh, our chief is very political. Uh, We deal a lot with local uh, state politicians and federal. 
So uh, in all of that, they have become very familiar with our tribe. And so they asked if the education director would be interested. They didn't know me from Adam. So it wasn't me. It was the Choctaw Nation education. Mm -hmm. And so then they asked if I would like to serve on that. And after they did their background checks and all that they have to do, I was selected to serve as one of their primary uh, people. And uh, we also had Alan Lovesey, who is an attorney, uh, that was the alternate that served on that committee. So it's, um, but that's what I like about my job is I never do the same thing twice in the same day. Uh, I think I'd become very bored very quickly if I had to sit in the office and do everything the same, but I don't. And uh, everything's different all the time, and I enjoy it. Well, you're also very involved in your church. Yes. Still teach Sunday school? I do. How long have you been teaching Sunday school? 50 years. That's a long time. It's a long time. And what ages are you teaching? I teach young couples. And uh, then on Wednesday nights, which is my favorite time, uh, a lot of your small churches have just about died, especially on Wednesday nights. People have gotten to the point they want to come to church on Sunday morning. And that's it. They don't come anymore. Uh, we started working on a program for our children. We are now feeding. On Wednesday nights, we run from 60 to 65 every Wednesday night. And uh, my husband and I, not having children or anything, we can go very early and stay very late. <laughs> and uh, we get to cook and clean and teach uh, children with many other people helping. But it's a, it's a big job but we enjoy it. And we've seen a lot of good things come from working with the children in our community. They come from all over. Uh, this is a small church, uh, very rural Oklahoma. Blue is, um, uh, doesn't have any businesses. It has, uh, still has an elementary school there. Uh, but other than that, there's not anything in Blue, Oklahoma. And uh, the church I attend is the only church that's in that area too. So uh, so we've got a lot of potential there. And uh, we felt like it's hard to get a lot of adult people to keep attending church. So why not get the children? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's probably the most important thing I do is uh, cook and clean. <laughs> and, and what's the name of the church? Blue Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. It's in Blue, Oklahoma. So it's just a very small uh, church where the people meet to worship and serve God. And, and what is it that still keeps you so connected to wanting to teach Sunday school all these years and keep giving back? Well, all of us, my mother told me when she was 98 years old, she was ill. She knew her life was about over. She said, I've lived such a short time at 98. Most people would say, oh, what a long life she had. That's short. If I live to be a hundred, I've lived a short time. What about eternity? There is no time. It's forever. So what we do here, we're looking toward eternity. Forever and forever. So what I do here for a short time has a lot of influence on where I'm going to be for an eternity. And so that's what I believe. And I never tire of it because... Uh, I really, truly believe that I'm a born-again Christian and that uh, what really matters in my life is the Lord Jesus Christ. In going through your, your uh, the material submitted for the Oklahoma Women's Hall of Fame, there was a, a line in there that I had to read a couple times uh, that I loved. And I'm sure you have plenty of, of sayings like this, but somebody said in your application packet, uh, you better get in gear or get out of her way. I can't imagine why anyone would have said that about me. Why would someone say that I'm about so, you? <laughs> well, I'm really easygoing and patient and never get bothered or upset. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't really feel it's that way, but if I am given a job to do, I'm going to do the job. So, 
you know, I don't have a lot of patience with people that are whiners and um, won't do their work. So maybe that's what they meant. I don't know. I hope I hope that's not true. All of that's true of me. But um, I definitely believe that if um, there's purpose and you have a job, you need to get it done. I think it was a very positive comment. Oh, okay. I hope so. <laughs> I think it, it's very telling, I think, of your, your determination and uh, getting the job done. Uh, but, but I thought, that's pretty good. You know? Well, it's true, but I don't always get all the jobs done. <laughs> There's not we don't time. always get all the things done. Not enough time in the day. No. Well, we learn uh, what we need for our career, the tools for our careers in many different places. Sometimes mm -hmm. in the classroom and sometimes, you know, real life experiences. Uh, where are some of the most important places uh, you've learned the background you needed for, for your career? You have to think about my age. We're a different generation. People that are older, we really don't know anything but work. Younger people often look for positions. People my age always look for a job and we're very glad when we had one and we would work hard to do the very best we could on that job. We have a lot of fine young people today, but people my age and the generation next year, uh, to me has ruined a lot of our young people. They were not taught to work. You watch people when the clock hits 4.30 or even 4.20 at the nation. They'll be lining up to clock out 10 minutes before time. We would have never thought of doing that. We didn't know what 40 hours a week was. Nowadays, people don't want to work 40 hours a week. Matter of fact, the chief told me one day that he had looked through many, many cards, just flipping through them, looking to see what he could find. And he looked for a period of over an hour and didn't find anyone that had worked 40 hours in one week. They'd either had sick leave, annual leave, whatever, but there wasn't 40 hours there. I got to thinking about that and noticing. Because we have so much annual leave and sick leave, people take off a lot of time. I could uh, retire today and they'd have to pay me for a year's work for my sick leave. I don't take sick leave. I, now yesterday afternoon I took a half a day to take my husband to the doctor. But I don't take sick leave. If I don't feel good, I go to work. That's just our generation. I'm not saying that that's what you should do. I'm telling you that's what we do. Or I'll take two Tylenol and keep going. Nowadays, people look for reasons to not be at work. And that's just a, a whole difference in our way we do things, the way we think about things. And we were taught that. We were taught to work. My dad never knew when to quit working. He was a hard worker. He worked too much. And I think sometimes, even about my own self, uh, when I go home, I want everything at home just like it is at work. I want my house clean. I want my yard mowed. I want my car washed. Um, I've done that my whole life. And sometimes I think how foolish I am. I really mean that because I'm doing a lot of things that I'm probably missing some things that are really important. I think about Mary and Martha in the Bible and how those two sisters, one was at Jesus' feet while the other one was washing the dishes. I'd have been washing the dishes and look what I would have missed. And so I really think that that's kind of the way my life is, that um, I work too hard. Um, I'm too much on everything's got to be done. Uh, and that's not true. But I don't know how you change people that have been brought up to work. I think it's just in your mind mm -hmm. to do that. So that's one of the big differences that I'm going to say that in my generation, we just do things differently than others. And I'm certainly not saying we're right. I think we, if we could somehow balance that, <laughs> it would be better for maybe both groups. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I think I have too high expectations of people, which isn't always good. Mm -hmm probably could set you up for disappointment. 
Oh, yeah. We all have our disappointments. Uh, I have five grandchildren. I never talked to one of my grandchildren about high school graduation. Never. Always, after you finish college, what are their plans after that? Because you know as well as I do, a college degree now is almost worthless. You've got to have something. People that go to college have got to plan for a special career and go on to beat that career. College just won't do it. And so I always expected that. Never, I hope they do that. I expected it. And uh, I think about sometimes, you know, that maybe they didn't want to go to college. <laughs> maybe they wanted to be a plumber <laughs> or something else, which is great. But I always expected their their best. And that's kind of the way I live my life. Well, looking back through your life and, and even in your, your career now, any major stumbling blocks or adversity that, that gets in the way? Probably, if I said anything, would be that I live in a small town. Had I lived somewhere closer, if I could have been close, in, even in Oklahoma, if I could have been close to OU, TU, some of these places, I would have went to law school. I always wanted to be an attorney. Um, just couldn't figure it out from being here. Uh, if anything, I would wish that I could have done those things. Do I feel bad about it? No, I'm not grieving over it or any of those things. Um, everything I've done, I look back and I'm, I'm fine with all of that. But I think all of us uh, would do some things differently uh, when we get older. Uh, far as I married young, I wouldn't change that. Uh, I have children, I wouldn't change that. Uh, very satisfied and happy in those areas. Um, but in education, as far as money goes, uh, as you get older, you really realize that you can be or should be very contented if you have the things you need. You know, we all have a million things that we just want. And uh, we're very wealthy in this country. I uh, am hoping to take a trip with Dr. Madge. He is a uh, doctor that was in Denison. Uh, he spends three weeks out of each uh every two months in South Africa doing surgeries. And uh, that's probably one of the last things that I'm hoping I can do is to travel some with him in missionary work and uh, see the country, be able to do some teaching and some work in those areas. Still have that desire. So my mother used to tell me she learned she She'd say, um, I learned something new today. That's a new wrinkle on my horn, and I'm not ready to die yet. That's how I feel. Still got some things to do. Looking back, we keep looking back, don't we? Looking back. Well, I, I don't have much to look forward to. A <laughs> <laughs> few years, maybe. <laughs> oh, come on now. <laughs> uh, career highlights for you. Surely you have some that just bring a smile to your face. Well, sure. We all do that. Um, first of all, to be able to work 45 years in education has got to be a high. Uh, just had the health to do that. And then the offers that I've had to be executive director of education for the Choctaw Nation. What an honor that is. Um, our people were behind. We're still behind. But we've come so far. We now have resources to work with. And the Indian people are no different than any other group of people. You have some very intelligent people that have so much to offer. And with the things that we're doing now, we're able to find these people, uh, help them to meet their potential. So career highs for me is anytime I see a person meet their potential, do the things in life that they really want to do and can do, uh, that's your reward. If you work in education, it'll never be money. It's people and the things that you see happen. Uh, so my career highs has always been watching and seeing what other people accomplish. 
whether I helped them or someone else helped them, or whether they're Indian or non-Indian. Uh, that's, that's a career high for you, is when you observe someone uh, and you see, my goodness, I would have never thought that, and you see them accomplish so much. Those are your career highs in education. Well, you were inducted into the Oklahoma Women's Hall of Fame in 2011. Mm -hmm. When you got the call, what was going through your mind? Why me? Uh, and especially after I got there and I saw a general and uh, doctors and people that I knew had to have done so much, I wondered why in the world am I here for the, with this group of people? Um, I'm just uh, an educator. Uh, I know a lot of people that have done a lot more than I'll ever think about doing uh, that have not been given this honor. Uh, so that's really was my thoughts. Why in the world me? Uh, couldn't understand really why I was nominated or any of those things. Uh, don't misunderstand. I was certainly honored. And uh, but lot, lots and lots of people deserved it a lot more than I did. And but I'll always be grateful. It was quite an honor. I think a lot of people who I talk to have that reaction. You know, what a great group of women. Why me? Mm -hmm. um, because you're just doing the work you're doing. That's right. But you're you're touching people. You're making that impact too. So, um, do you remember who introduced you at the ceremony? Yes, Chief Powell. And, and what was that like, listening to him say all those things about you? I couldn't believe he could lie that good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's a um, chief's very humble man himself. And uh, he feels the same way. You know, he's been inducted into everything I guess there is and what have you. He feels the same way. He doesn't understand why. He's just someone that's had a great vision, worked hard, trying to help people in every way he knows. Um, so knowing him like I do, I, I was proud that, uh, that he would do that and say those things. And I, I believe he meant them. Um, so I was honored to be introduced by, uh, the chief of the nation, uh, because he's very highly thought of. What does this type of honor mean to you? You know, <laughs> I don't know that it has a whole lot of meaning to me because I don't give, care anything about being praised. Mm -hmm. No, I just don't. Mm -hmm. I think it means a lot to my family. Uh, that's kind of how my brother explained it to me, that it meant a lot to him. Um, I think if he had gotten this honor, it would have meant a lot to me. Um, my daughters felt the same way. Uh, they were very proud of me and that I was recognized for working and working and working all these years. Uh, but I think that I am proud of this more because my family is proud of this. Well, through the years you've touched many students and many people uh, from education to your efforts with church and you name it, everything in between. How do you feel that now some people may look at you as that role model? Well, I don't really know that. I think I'm a good role model. And I say that because, uh, not because I'm perfect and far from it, but I try hard. I try to live the same life here that I would live anywhere else I might be. Because you see, I don't really worry about people watching me so much because God sees me, no matter what I'm doing, what I'm saying, or where I am. And he's the person I need to please, not people. But as far as being a good role model, uh, it's not always all the things that you're not doing, because I don't do a lot of bad things. But I do think that I try to do some things that's worthwhile, and that is helping other people, caring about others. So a lot of times it's not what you're doing. What are you not doing? What could you be doing? And so I think I do quite a few things that, uh, that I don't always just see about joy. But I'm all, I am a caretaker. 
And I do that too much. I'm going to take care of everybody. And you can't always do that. But uh, don't think too much about myself or my own needs. You made mention of, of your, your parents and your family. Are there any people you'd like to make mention of that have really played a, a big role in your life? Well, other than my family, and uh, we're a close family. Now, we're like any family. We might yay yeah, yeah every once in a while, but we all love each other. That's the one thing that we had in our family. We never had money or prestige or any of those things. Now, in the old days, uh, we look back at the generations. Uh, I'm very proud of my grandfather on my mother's side that he went to law school uh, at Vanderbilt and got his degree. And for an Indian boy to go to school in 1894, that was quite an accomplishment. And I think about how much I would have loved to talk to him. I look at my family on my dad's side that uh, they were preachers and I think about one of them that was the doctor here in Durant, one of the very first doctors, and I think how smart he was because he was the doctor and the undertaker and the pharmacist. Well, he was a smart man because he had you any way you went. So I kind of think about on the Clark side of the family and how they were pioneers. Times were hard, and they were people that excelled. My mother was a student at the Oklahoma Presbyterian College. Um, pursued her education. So there's just a lot of things that you have a lot of pride in your family uh, about. Uh, others, goodness, all of us could name people that along our way, they've been an encouragement to us. You know, sometimes just that extra pat on the back or someone that gave you an opportunity. I think about the people that hired me on my first job. I had to be as green as a gourd. And but for some reason they hired me. Uh, so we've all got people in our lives that uh, we owe and we thank. And how do you pay back? By giving to someone else. That's the only way you can do it. Any advice for your, your fellow Oklahomans? Well, I'm proud of Oklahoma. Uh, whether it be the Indian part or the white part. I'm proud of both. Uh, Oklahoma was a land that was, uh, uh, when we came here, it was just Indian territory. Uh, it's, a, it's a poor state. Um, not as much industry and things that you find in other states. But if you look around, it's one of the most beautiful states you'll find. Uh, all of the wooded area and the mountains and the water that we have. Uh, it's a state to be proud of. I would just encourage all the way from our politicians that they need to be honest. They need to care about the people and do what is right. Uh, I think that the people themselves need to uh, be that role model that we need to be by uh, working hard and um, being productive and successful and be proud of ourselves. If you're not proud of yourself, you can't help anyone else. So. That's what I'm proud of Oklahoma. Any words of wisdom for, for boys and girls who want to follow in your footsteps? Well, most people. The only way you're going to succeed and be where you want to be is work hard. You cannot expect anyone else to get you there, not even your parents. You know, parents can send you to school, but they can't learn for you. I would encourage everyone to have respect for themselves. Work hard. Do what you need to do. Be what you want to be. The opportunities are out there. Even for the people that are the poorest of the poor, you can do and be what you want to be, but you have to work for it. So it's up to you. So what's next on the agenda? You mentioned... Possibly some missionary work. Mm -hmm. What are you What are you looking forward to? Well, I'm looking forward right now. Uh, we're renovating our building. Uh, where Jones is just our school has just been reinstated. The government took our school away from us in the 50s. It just was voted into law. Uh, 
December the 23rd that Jones Academy is reinstated as a BIA school and we'll be uh, there's a lot of transition there that we've got to do so I'm on that uh, we've, we're writing a five-year plan uh, where we want to be in the education department five years from now uh, that's a, a big rock for us so we're really working on that I'd like to see that finished uh, Jones reinstated uh, see a language school built and then I may decide to retire from that one job. <laughs> I paused there for a second. I was waiting. Mm. Uh, I may be a Walmart greeter. Who knows? I think I'd make a good one. You know, I think people who are used to working constantly have to stay busy. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of things you could probably do at home, but Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I wished I liked to cook, so crafts, but I don't. None of the none of the above. So I've got to be careful. I'll go home and look around and say, "What am I going to do now?" You, you've 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 told me a little bit about Oklahoma, and I can kind of tell how you feel about the state. But 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 what does Oklahoma mean to you? Well, being from being an Indian. Uh, studying the history, I look at that sometimes um, a little sad, uh, proud of Oklahoma, but a little sad in that how our people came here, what happened to them, uh, the greed that you see, but you've had greed since the beginning of time, and you'll have greed when this world ends. Uh, it's the downfall of uh, most everyone. It'll be the downfall of our country. But when I really look at Oklahoma and I start thinking about uh, all of the things here and what has happened, um, it makes me a little sad because right now we're into all of this water thing, uh, people wanting all the water that actually belongs to the Indian people. And that's a big deal for this part of Oklahoma. We don't really hear too much about this up north, but down right. here it's a big deal. Well, the big deal and the reason you haven't heard so much about it it's not your land. Mm -hmm. It's not being taken from your people. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that to be harsh, but when you have a treaty that says forever, then you have to determine how long is forever. And uh, when you just tell people, because now this is a poor part of the country, uh, poor people down here. Now then, you get in the northern part where you have industry and people with a lot of wealth, then we just take. Mm -hmm. Well, what they forgot is the Indian people are not poor anymore. Now we have the money to fight back, and that's what it takes. We can hire the best lawyers there are, and we go back to the treaties that said forever. Now then, if we go all the way to the Supreme Court, there's no other way than to be found in the favor of the Indian people, because it's all in writing. And I think that's what they forgot about. We will just decide on the governor's level that this is what we're going to do. And the answer today is no. Now we're as smart as you are, and we've got as much money as you've got. So we're going to be fair. And that's what we want. We want to be fair. We don't want to air all the water down here and you not have any. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to take all of the water just because you want it. Or we could go to the forest, the lumber. Mm -hmm. uh, that was all illegally taken. Uh, we could talk about a lot of things, and we all know this. They're all in, it's all in writing. The, the treaties are there. So if you want to go back, uh, but those were things that happened in generations back that you had nothing to do with, nor did I. But we're talking about today. And today we're not going to lose our water, and we're not going to lose our timber just because someone else says so. We're going to do it the fair way and the right way. Mm -hmm. And that's it. So you have, you have mixed feelings about Oklahoma. Well, my feelings are I love the people. I love the, you know, I love the state and uh, the beauty of it. And I'm very much for our government, mm -hmm. um, very much for, you know, I vote and I'm interested in who's running and what we're going to do and all of that. But it wouldn't matter if it was something different. Let's do what's right. Mm -hmm. 
I'm telling you, people that do what's right will end up where they need to be. Whenever you don't do what's right, at some point it's going to come back to haunt you. That's what's happening now. Things weren't done right. Now then they think they can continue to do these and it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Let's just do what's right. Indians as well as the whites. Yeah. I think everybody, if we if we just do that, would probably be that's further ahead. That's exactly how I feel. And easier to sleep at night. Let's be fair. Mm -hmm. As we near the end, is there anything else you'd like to add that we haven't talked about today? We kind of went a real quick fast forward through your life. I really can't think of anything. You, you've asked me a lot of questions. and uh, I don't know anything else I would say other than I appreciate you and appreciate your interest. and um, Certainly, this nomination has meant a great deal to me, and thank you for doing that. Uh, the interview is good. Uh, I guess you'll archive these, and there'll be something just that is kept. So that'll be good. Well, as uh, as we look back on, on your life, and a question I like to ask people as I close out interviews is, when history is written about you, what would you like for it to say? Probably that she really cared, especially for young people. I don't have a lot of patience with adults. I feel like they've had opportunities and maybe made some bad choices. But young people still, they're at a crossroads. And I think that all of us as role models or adults or as mamas and dads or teachers, whatever, that it is our responsibility to really care about them and do what we can to help them to take the right path. And so I would hope that people would say she's someone that spent her life caring about others. I think they will. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you.